welcome back. Now, my next guest is perhaps best known for carrying on, but he's in fact a distinguished actor with a score of stage successes behind him. He was in the original stage production of his friend Joe Orton's play Loot. He was also part of that much-loved radio series Round the Horn. With a name like his, it's not surprising to discover that both his parents are of Welsh stock. Ladies and gentlemen, please greet Kenneth Williams. What a great honour, what a great honour it is for you to have me. <laughs> I was waited long enough to come on, but a very nice build-up, very nice indeed. Did you like and it? And I feel quite honoured in this company. I mean, that girl Valerie, quite brilliant. The draftsmanship. D did you like the paintings? Stunning. And those two, <laughs> bounding on like that, did you see those two come? Weren't they full of energy? Especially. <laughs> you can see exactly why they're selling colostomy bags. <laughs> <laughs> And when she said, you know, Valerie, about doing them in the mines and actually being allowed in to see them quite naked in showers, I was suddenly reminded of when we filmed that Carry On Constable, because there was a scene where all the policemen had to come out of showers and a lady policeman, which played by Joan Sims, was to come in with her towel and be shocked and run. And the cameraman said to the director, I can't film it, Jerry. Look through the camera. All the bums are flaring. <laughs> and, uh, and Gerald looked through the lens and said, he's right. All the bums are flaring. We can't film it like that. They must get made up. So we were all shoved on top, <laughs> on the top of trestle tables. And these makeup men sloshed all this, um, <coughs> sloshed all this wet white over the bums, you see. And this makeup man said, oh, I've done some things in my time. <laughs> I mean... I mean, I've done Margaret Lockwood, but, I, but I've never done a bum. And he was there sloshing it on. And Leslie Phillips was really quite angered by it all and said, I think we should make a stand. <laughs> we should make a stand, which is rather unfortunate language. Absolutely. Yes. It's like to make a stand. This is ignoble. I mean, it's humiliating having to stand here, having your bum made up. <laughs> and, um, and, and Kenny Connor said, listen, these films are doing well. They're getting the, the money at the tills up. The audiences are up. So get your bum made up. <laughs> and, um, and he submitted to it quite cheerfully. And Charles Charlie Hawtrey was only concerned with whether it matched the, the body makeup, matched the face. And he said, you know, is it Poudre Rochelle? I mean, I've got to be, I've got to be very careful. Must match. That's so all he was concerned with, Charlie. He was the most eccentric actor, you know, was I she ever really? came upon. He used to bring his mother, Mrs. Hawtrey, onto the set. She was over 80, and she used to sit there rather absentmindedly watching everything. And one day she was sitting there. We all had a circle of chairs on the set with our names on the back, you know, we all loved all that. <laughs> <laughs> and Mrs. Hawtrey was sitting there, and Charlie was carrying on about the first play he'd done in the West End, and how Eric Portman had been the first night, and very impressed by him. And his mum was listening to this, and, and her fag fell <laughs> from the lips into the handbag, and it all began to smoulder. <laughs> and, uh, and Hattie Jake said, Charlie, your mother's handbag, Charlie! Your mother's bag! It's on fire! And Charlie, with his cup of tea, said, oh, yeah, and dropped the tea into it. <laughs> and she snapped it shut. And the whole sodden mass <laughs> was all hidden from view. You've had a few disasters. Oh, disasters. You? I mean, I did a tour, you know, with Peggy and Mount. And, I mean, ladies and me, a disaster. I've had loads of disasters with Hattie, <laughs> loads of disasters with Joni Sims. And, and with Peggy, we, we landed up eventually with this farce. It was called Sinus Heel. It was a Fado farce. And we landed up in Newcastle. It was the heat wave. Do you remember that year where England was just sweltering under a heat wave? 76 or 77. That's right. Yes. And we played this theatre to nothing. And there were about 20 people out front. Absolutely gasped, supposed to be a three-act comedy. And I was sitting in the dressing room just before the end, and the manager of the theatre came in and said, there's terrible things happened on the radio. You won't have heard, but on the radio tonight they've announced Dame Cyril, Dame Cyril Thorndike. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes, he meant Cyril. <laughs> Dame Cyril Thorndike is gone. She's gone. I said, oh, really? I'm not going to go there. He said, yes, she's gone. And no, it was in this theatre. It was in this theatre, this very theatre, she made a debut in Candida, he meant Candida, <laughs> in Candida, and I want you to make a speech from the stage about this wonderful woman, Dame Cyril, wonderful woman. <laughs> oh, he said, I've known them all, I've known them all, I've had, I've had them all, I've had John Gingold. <laughs> oh, I've had them all in this very theatre, make a speech about this wonderful woman. And I said, I'm not making any speech about somebody dying, at the end of a three-act comedy. He said, you don't understand, it's on the radio. You don't understand, this woman's dead. I said, I've been on tour for five weeks and died every night, but nobody's made a funeral arrangement. <laughs> 
I didn't do it. And the pianist in the, the, pianist in the stalls was playing, yeah. I'll see you again, <laughs> which was to see the audience out. And he went on and, and made, the, made the speech himself. Yes. So what it sounded they, like a seance, you know. What were they like, these older women to work with? What about Dame Edith Evans? Edith instance? Evans was, well, that's another disaster, you see. We opened, <laughs> we, opened, we opened in Brighton, and it wasn't received well. It was called Gentle Jack. It wasn't received well at all. And when we took the taxi back to the hotel, she said to me, did you get any notes after the show? I said, yes, they, they gave me a note about Act 3, a rewrite. She said, yes, they gave me a note. I said, what did they say to you? She said, well, they said, Hardy Amy's has designed very regal costumes. <laughs> you should look equally regal in them. Do you think that's justified? I said, I think any criticism of your deportment is tantamount to impertinence. <laughs> and she said, you are a very pleasant young man. <laughs> then there's no reason why the right girl shouldn't come along. Oh. Obviously thinking, you know, that marriage and the ideal lady would be, you know, reward for virtue. Yeah. And we got into the hotel, and she was accompanied everywhere by her Christian science advisor, because she had constipation and wouldn't take any medicine. <laughs> and uh, they, 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 they believed, you know, that, uh, that by spirituality they would recover the, the remedy. And um, this, this old fart, who was the night porter, <laughs> he, he, he came in and we were, we, we, we were left, you know, with just one plate and a, a tin thing on top of some curling lettuce because everyone else had had their meal. We didn't turn up till after the curtains about 11.30. Everyone else had dined. So in this empty dining room were these tin plates laid and this old man shuffled in, this old night porter, and said, your partner in crime's had her grub. She's gone to bed. <laughs> partner in crime was a spiritual advisor. <laughs> <laughs> She's gone to bed, she couldn't wait up till half past 11. So do you fancy a drop of something with yours? And she said, well, I think a half bottle of Beaujolais would not come amiss. And I thought she'd fancy a drop of that. Oh, I've got something in the sideboard here, and I'll just get... And he bent down and erectated. It was a very loud one. <laughs> And, and it was a terrible, I mean, a terrible, terrible noise, you see. It rang out, and, and she said to me, this place has gone off terribly. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and took it all in her stride. Yes. She really wasn't put off by anything. And the opening night in London, there was a terrible lot of barracking, awful barracking from the gods, really terrible. But as the curtain hit the deck, she said to me, well, that was one bravo. And I said, no, it was go home, <laughs> they shouted. And they told me after this very rudely, they said, you shouldn't have enlightened her. Let her think it was a bravo. Yes. But it wasn't. It was go home! <laughs> <laughs> worked in Wales, Kenneth? Yes, all. I worked in Wales with Clifford Evans. I worked with Clifford Evans. We did a season at well, Wastel Bean, the initiation, the uh, running in, so to speak, of a National Theatre of Wales, which did not materialise, but it was a marvellous season. And we opened there in Swansea at the Grand, and we had Richard Burton, some marvellous people in the company, and that marvellous man that was in the Steptoe thing. Oh, Br yes, Bramble. Bramble Wilfred. And, and Rachel, Rachel Roberts, oh, she was superb. She was really marvellous. I think Rachel was at her best in that period. And I was, I was understudying, I know it sounds bad, barmy, but I was understudying Richard Burton. He was playing Constantine. <laughs> I know, and it's ridiculous. A great fellow like him. And uh, I mean, enormous shoulders, you know, Richard. Feel like an yeah. ox. And he was playing Constantine in the Sea Garden. I was covering him, which I was understudying. And I came there one day, I'll never forget it, I came in, the stage doorkeeper said, you better get up to his dressing room, quick, he's ill. And I, I thought, oh no, I can't, I can't, you know, I couldn't go on. Mm. And I shot up to his dressing room, he was green, he had tomain poisoning, he'd eaten some tin stuff which contained a, a poison. And um, the doctor said, you must take this, you know, what, what antibiotic, mm. and you must rest. And he was lying on this divan. I said, you've got to go on. I can't go on. <laughs> and he said, I can't, I'm very ill. I said, rubbish, I, I can't go on. I, I've never learned it. <laughs> and, and he said, are you, are you serious? Do you really not know the part? I said, I don't know, lying, <laughs> lying. I said, please, please go on. Oh, you go on. <laughs> oh, I was nearly crying. I said, you go on, I'll give you my salary. He said, how much do you earn? And I said, seven, seven pound a week. And he said, wouldn't cover my expenses. Wouldn't cover his expenses, you yeah, see. Yeah. It was ludicrous. He said, all right, if you really mean it, you don't know a line, I said, I don't. He said, well, go next door to the pub and get that draft ale, get plenty of it in. That'll just get me through it. So I went next door and I had to smuggle it in through a, under the raincoat, looking like a pregnant idiot. <laughs> and I had to get this, this beer. And he was belching terribly with this beer. <laughs> And the scene with our cardinal, you are the son of a Kiev shopman, and you are a third-rate Moscow actress, and he was bawling all this out. 
and he came off exultant because he, he was mad with a terrific round on his exit and he came into the wings and grabbed hold of me and shouted if you're ever in a jam i'm your man <laughs> Thing, you know, which always did his rhymes. If you ever have a tree, send for me. If you're ever in a jam, I'm your man. And the stage doorkeeper rushed around and said, What on earth's going on? Because the row could be heard. And Madame Arcardina came off the stage and looked at him very angry. And she said, If you drank a little bit, the audience might enjoy it a little more. Oh. And swam past, and then he belched again. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> And by the time she looked round, his mouth had closed. Kenneth, you've done a bit of everything. You've done acting, you're, you're an author. Uh, you're an, a great mimic. Are you an avid watcher and listener of people? Oh, yes. I think I don't think I get any ideas. I mean, people say to me, you know, creative ideas that come from imagination. I don't agree. I mean, I've got all mine from life, never from imagination. And uh, Peter Sellers, you know, said that marvellous story about the Scoutmaster coming around and talking like Blue Bottle. Do you remember that? He said a Scoutmaster had called on him. And, I did do, 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 do like that at a time, you know. <laughs> oh, I've got a scout group and we were lucky. And he started doing blue butter <laughs> from that. And I got a lot of my ideas from the same source. People would come backstage or I'd meet them in life. I remember an old newspaper, sir. I got the idea of that old man from him. He actually said to me, because I said, I got this terrible jaw. I couldn't speak. I was using a, an American accent in a film. And I said to this man, I've been using this voice, you see, and it's out of the corner of the mouth. It's kind of kind of figure like this way, you know, I figure. I I got an idea. I sit on the lavatory seat and seat six miles behind. I said, now I've been doing it and the jaw's gone out of alignment. He said, shut your mouth, tie a scarf around <laughs> and it'll heal in the morning. And that's how he talked. Shut your mouth, tie a scarf around your egg oh. and it'll go away in the morning. And I got the idea listening to him of the voice. And I used it on Hancock's half. I used it on Round the Horn, used it all over the place. And I got the idea of the snide voice from a boy who worked in the mint and he told me that at the initiation ceremony, they covered him with printer's ink, you know, yeah. and stripped all the clothes off him. And he said, oh, I felt really awful. I said, oh, 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 I put all my clothes on. I said, oh, no, it's not meant to be I couldn't stand it. And so I realised that by talking with your, your mouth open, smiling, you know, you have to go. Yes. You, know, you automatically go into that kind of voice. And when I was in Sydney, they said, you must come to this restaurant because there's a boy in this cabaret who does you. And I was sitting there watching. And this man came on and said, my impersonation, I'm not allowed to give you my impersonation, that's Gang Australian, you know, why they talk. My impersonation of Kenny Williams. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, I thought, oh dear, it's terrible. And he came to the table and said, what did you think of me? And I said, well, one of us is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, just a minute must be a dawdle for you because you've just done 12 and I haven't asked a question. <laughs> oh, what a victory. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, well Kenneth Williams. Thank you. That was incredible. Thank you.